so, so far, chapter 23 has talked about all of the um, history of Darwin and how he came up with his theories and all of his observations from his trip on the Beagle and how he wrote on the origin of species and all of that. But now, let's talk about the evidence since then that has continued to prove his theory of evolution. Um, because remember, Darwin never actually called it evolution. He called it descent with modification. So he noticed that all these species were changing a little bit with every single generation, which was different than what had been previously thought during his time because at that time everyone thought the world God made the world the way it is and it's not changing and Darwin was beginning to see that that probably wasn't the case um, and so since Darwin wrote on the origin of species we've continued to develop our well name it evolution and then and continue to develop it and come up with new theories and new evidence for it um, so there's Three that your textbook talks about, I think. It's direct observations of evolutionary change, so we can actually see the evolutionary change happening. Um, homology, which are similar structures. Um, and biogeography. And the fossil record. Okay, sorry, I knew it was missing one. The fossil record. So... The first one is direct evolution of evo or direct observations of evolutionary change. So we have actually been able to see evolutionary change happening. And there's two examples your textbook give, textbook gives. One is um, natural selection in response to introduced plant species and the evolution of drug resistant bacteria. So the very first one is this species of um, oh, your textbook talks about a different one. Your textbook talks about um, predation and coloration in guppies and this one talks about these specific birds so let me tell you about these birds basically they're um, or these bugs I'm sorry they're called soap berry bugs and they have this beak that they use to eat seeds from inside of fruit um, but there's two different kinds of fruit there's small fruit that have seeds that are closer to the outside because it's smaller and there's bigger fruit that have seeds further away from the outside because the fruit is bigger so scientists observed that the birds that were feeding on the smaller fruit had smaller beaks because they didn't need longer beaks to get to the seeds. Whereas the birds that were feeding on the bigger fruit, they had much longer beaks because they needed those long beaks to be able to get all the way inside the fruit. Um, and so they've seen this similarity or this correlation between beak size and fruit size in a bunch of different, in a bunch of different locations. Um, and so in all cases, they notice that the beak size correlated perfectly. So larger fruits had longer beaks, smaller fruits had smaller beaks. Um, and then they, what they did was they introduced the different kind of plant species to, to a location in Florida, and they noticed that in 35 years, the birds changed their beaks. Um, so basically, there were small fruits there, so all the birds had small beaks, and over 35 years, the population changed when they introduced large fruits to having large beaks. So that's how swiftly evolution can happen. So each generation, the ones with longer beaks could suddenly eat these big fruits that no one else was eating, so they survived to pass on their traits. And so each generation, um, the beaks got a little bit longer. So that's one example of direct, oh, here we go, of direct evolution of, um, or direct observations of evolution. So here is one of the bugs sticking its beak into the fruit. And so... You can see that naturally the bugs that lived in Florida had um, large fruits, so they ate. So they, here's their beak size. Um, they were, the beak length was mostly very large. And then they introduced the smaller fruits, um, and they saw that the beak length changed drastically. So that's, they saw it happen. They saw the beak, beak size change over time. And so, it's important to remember that natural selection does not create new traits. It's mutations that create new traits, um, or natural variation that's already there. And so, natural selection just simply um, chooses one trait over the other. Basically, this trait is more adaptive. You're more likely to live to pass on your genes than this trait. So, this is the trait that's going to be more prevalent in the population, because those parents survive to pass on their traits. Um, and then a local environment determines which will be selected for or against in any specific population. So basically, the natural selection is going to be different from here in Southern California to Central California to Northern California because all of the populations are different. 
So even if there's the same kinds of living things in these areas, different traits are going to be selected for because the environment is different. Even ants on my street are going to be different than ants one street over, or different than ants in Gardena. So it's all the environment that causes natural selection. So another really important piece of evidence for evolution is what's called homology. And homology is similarity resulting from common ancestry. So on the most basic level, you look like your parents because you have, or you look like your siblings because you have the same parent. Um, on a more drastic level, all humans have eyes and ears and noses and hands and thumbs because we all had one common ancestor. So that, that's what homology is, similarities, similar traits based on ancestry. And so homologous structures are anatomical resemblances that represent variations on a structural theme present in a common ancestor. So basically, we, we all mammals have four limbs, right? That's because the common ancestor for all mammals had four limbs and carried babies in a uterus, okay? Because that's a characteristic of mammals. Um, now, we don't all look the same as our common ancestor, so think about your dog, that's a mammal. We have similarities, but we're not exactly the same. But we have several structural similarities, and those are the homologous structures. So here's one. Here are a bunch of mammal forelimbs, so your front. We don't walk on all fours, but if we did, this would be our front arm, or our front leg, our arms. So in humans, we have, here's all the bones. You've probably seen a picture of this before. You can tell that there's two bones in your forearm, one, bo one bone in your upper arm. Um, and then a cat has all of the same bones, but they're arranged differently. See how their radius is shorter, their ulna is longer, and then their phalanges are pointing a different direction, and their humerus is a little bit of a different shape, but it's all the same bones. But they're used for basically the same thing, right? We use ours for grasping things, but they were at one time used for walking, which is what a cat uses them for. A whale totally different structure, right? They have fins, but inside their fins are all of the same exact bones that are inside your arms. So the humerus is now this tiny little bone. All of the big ones are very reduced because they're not weight-bearing, right? They use them to swim. And so you can see that all of the bones are exactly the same, even though totally different structure. And same thing over here with the, this is a bat wing. I know my face is covering it. That wing is used for flight, but again, all the same bones in the same configuration that you have in your arms, that cats have in their legs, that whales have in their fins. These are called homologous structures. Homo meaning the same, homologous meaning that they have they came from the same place. Um, and then there's also comparative embryology, which means that if you look at the embryos of a lot of living things, they all look the same early, early in development. So obviously, a full term baby, if there's a woman who's almost about to give birth to a baby, it's going to look like a human, but very, very early in development, it's going to look the same as any other animal baby, basically, um, because there's a bunch of anatomical homologies, so structures that are the same, that are not visible in adult organisms. So here's a chick embryo. This will grow into a chicken. Here's a human embryo. This will grow into a human. How much alike do they look? It's kind of scary, right? So this provides evidence for evolution because it says, what are the chances that, that this happened on its own? That there wasn't once um, a common ancestor that had an embryo that looked like this, right? What are the chances that our embryos look exactly the same if we're not related to each other? So basically, there's some characteristics that, that embryos have that don't develop in adults. So for example, there's these things called pharyngeal pouches, which are pouches on the pharynx, which is right here. They're basically gills. You have them when you're an embryo. You don't have them now, which is good because you use your lungs to breathe, but they are there, present in embryos of humans and embryos of chicks. Remember, chickens don't have gills either, so those go away. Then, uh, post-anal tail. So basically, this is a tail at the end of your spine. Um, you don't have this anymore, obviously. Chickens have a very small tail, I think. Um, but basically, our tail goes away. But we have it in common with all other embryos very early in development. Then there's things called vestigial structures. Vestigial structures are structures that um, we have that we don't use, but were used in previous ancestors um, for a specific function. For example, our, what's vestigial in us? Our appendix. You don't use your appendix for anything. But there was a time when 
our ancestors used it for something, probably for digesting vegetation. We don't eat as much raw vegetation, so we don't need it to break down vegetables anymore, um, like leaves. We don't eat too many leaves. Um, another vestigial organ are leg bones in whales. Whales do not have legs, but they still have the bones for legs because there was a time when a whale's ancestor walked on land, and then later they moved into the water and lost their hind legs because they didn't need them anymore. So those who had smaller legs over time um, were more fit because they weren't wasting energy on their legs. And so generation after generation after generation, whales lost their legs, but they still have the bones. They're still in there. I don't have a picture of that for you. But whales have hind limb bones even though they don't have hind limbs. So those are vestigial structures. Um, there's also the crazy molecular homologies such as DNA. All living things have DNA. Straight up, there's no, there's no way getting around that. We all have DNA, um, which is pretty crazy that we are very, very, very distantly related to this plant, but we use the same genetic code, AGCT, AGCT, DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase, same exact thing. So those molecular similarities account for that we probably at one point shared a common ancestor with a plant. Just crazy to think about, but it probably happened. Um, okay, so evolutionary trees are hypotheses about rebel about relationships among different groups. So when we think about how different living things have descended from each other or have shared a common ancestor, we can put this into a tree that way we can visualize it more. Um, and then we can see that homologies form nested patterns. So groups of animals that appear to be dis descendant from a common ancestor are going to have homologies. They're going to have homologous structures because they came from the same living thing. For example, all of my sisters and I have blue eyes because my parents have blue eyes. So that would be a homology among the McCaffrey girls. Um, and then we can make different kinds of evolutionary trees from DNA data. Um, or physical appearance, which you'll find out is not always really correct. So here's an evolutionary trait. If this shows the evolution of touch, meaning animals that have four legs, four limbs, we are one of them, um, from an organism that does not have four legs. So the most common relative to those of us who have four legs that does not have four legs is called a lungfish. And then right here you can see that this was the common ancestor between tetrapods and lungfish, right here, number one. And then all of the rest of the ancestors developed digit-bearing limbs, which means we have fingers and toes, and we use those limbs. Um, so all of these that come, amphibians, mammals, lizards and snakes, crocodiles, ostriches, etc., etc., we all have digit bearing limbs and we all de we all descendant from this number two we all shared a common ancestor at one point mammals shared a common ancestor with amphibians um and then right here is something called amnion which is um meaning having a having an egg that develops inside of the body for a baby so that's what that is like amniotic fluid in a pregnancy um so mammals lizards and snakes all of these guys have um, amnion. So you can see where the where the most common ancestor was. So we shared a common ancestor more recently with mam with lizards and snakes than we did with amphibians. Um, but ostriches and hawks and other birds had a much more recent common ancestor because they are much more closely related. Um, so you can see the homologous characteristics. For example, feathers is a homologous characteristic of ostriches and hawks and other birds. Um, Whereas digit-bearing limbs is a homologous characteristic between amphibians and all of the rest of them. Um, so then there's a couple of other kinds of evolution, a couple of other kinds of evidence of these things, which we'll talk about in the next video.